Well, it seems that some of us live on different planets. <laughs> Stephen Mayne thinks that feminism is about women on boards. God help me. Although I will, recognize, I will register that there are 6,000 women registered to be on women on boards. Virginia has seemingly forgotten that no woman read the news on ABC until 1982 because their voices weren't authoritative. She's lucky she's got the job. And Gay's in a position to make changes. I want to say to you today that feminism has been one of the powerful social movements of the last 40 years. As a working grandmother, I'm glad I've got that title, I can see enormous changes during that time. Feminism was never a political party. It's not a thing. Monica's given you some of the theory around that. It was an idea that happened across the world in the 60s and the 70s. And it wasn't something that you waited to get something from. You actually had to do it. Sisters had to do it for themselves. We need to remember that. We don't just sit around like little princesses hoping that it's all going to work for us. But luckily, some of the changes have happened. Before feminism, as women, we had no voice. We certainly weren't on the front pages of the magazine until we started to act up and out. That got us there very smartly. And if one of the great successes of feminism, which I notice that the other side did not mention, is the education of women. And education is still the main game in every country in the world. And in this country, 55% of graduates are female. When I went to university, less than 20% of the intake was female. It was, of course, a long, very long time ago. Before feminism, it was hard to find your voice because the cultural assumptions were so extraordinarily different about what women could be, might be, or who we were. My university scholarship, I had to score more marks than a male because it was thought that they would stay longer. On the other hand, when I got married after three years, my bond was waived because marriage was a suitable career for a woman. But I couldn't go back to teaching. When my friends got married in the Commonwealth public sector, they both had jobs on Friday. On Monday, he did and she didn't. And that was the case until 1966. And as far as we know, the only thing that happened in the weekend to change their suitability was that they had sex with each other. <laughs> they may have had before, but at least we know it was legitimate. In 1960s, abortion was almost inaccessible and women died. In my own experience, to get an abortion required furtive phone calls, 63 guineas, large amount of money, cops patrolling up and down the road, hoping that someone would give you some advice when you left. They didn't give you contraception. If you were lucky, you got a pill. Panadol equivalent, probably Bex, and ask you to have a good lie down, but not with the bloke. <laughs> and that was it. Contraception was the privilege of doctors. When I went to my first um, doctor to get contraception, he said, I can't give you a script until you're married. It was 1964, and I said, I'm getting married in three months. And he said, Well, I certainly will. I'll date it the day of your wedding. It's 50 years this year since the pill was available, but it was not available to unmarried women. And when you did buy it, it was classified as a luxury tax, the same as a, um, the, the same as a cosmetic, and it was very expensive and not available to all. And it was got one of Gough Whitlam's first things to take the luxury tax off the contraception. Family planning clinics didn't see unmarried women easily. Childbirth was also a doctor's choice. You went along and you said, I'd like to have a baby, and he said, I'll knock you out. It won't be quite nice. I look after all my girls really well. Really? I want to do it my way. It required a lot of work. This is what feminism was about. It's the sum total of the parts 
of women supporting each other and taking up challenges to change things for the better for all of us. In work, we had jobs, not careers, and there were legal impediments like the marriage bars. My story, my friend, one of my friend's mothers was a pharmacist. She married a bank manager. You can put this in your file, Stephen. Now the ANZ, then the ESNA. And when they went to a town in Queensland, she said, well, now that we're married, I'm going to get a job in a pharmacist here. I'll probably buy one. And the bank said, no, you can't work, because what would everyone say? They would say, well, we were not paying the bank manager enough money to support his wife. Six weeks ago, she got her first paycheck. She said, I'll never bank it. I'll just put it there to remind me of how hard it's been. Feminism's worked for her. It might have taken a long time, but it's worked. Equal pay, the unions didn't support equal pay. Corporations didn't support equal pay. It was women who went to get equal pay. And I'm not pretending that we have it. But we have more rights about how to negotiate it than we ever had. No maternity leave existed. When I was teaching, as soon as I announced my pregnancy, they said, right, take you off those classes because you won't be coming back. If I came back, it was as a casual worker. And then, of course, the ultimate cultural assumption. My favorite response to the Women's Electoral Lobby Survey in 1972, which polled every member, every candidate for parliament, to see what the views were about women. And Sir John Kramer, then the member for Benelong, in response to what is a woman's greatest attribute, said, I think the test for all women, the greatest attribute they can have is virginity. <laughs> this is 1972. Now, for those of us who'd lost it, we wondered what our residual value could possibly be. <laughs> Not politics. My argument is that change didn't just happen, and guys, it doesn't just happen. You have to do it. It's not inevitable. Inevitability has never worked for social movements. You have to get on with it. Across the world, women's groups in the 60s and the 70s talked about access to contraception. Yes, we now have it. The right to abortion. Not legal, but we can get one. Equal pay, not perfect, but a lot better, and with legal responses and legal processes that we can go for. Childcare, still one of the big unanswered ones, because the cultural assumptions around the value of children haven't changed. On the other hand, I am increasingly seeing that feminism has created spaces for men to be better parents and to enjoy their children and have much more equal relationships. It was one of the dreams of the feminist movement. Discrimination legislation is enabling. Changes in divorce law, no-fault divorce in 1975. More women in parliament was one of the early ones. And so for the 70s, that decade of consciousness raising, we forced Australian politics to respond, political parties, and they did. Business and public sector were slower to act, but in the 80s, a lot of things were fixed up. And what a contemporary feminist dream of. We dream of leadership now. It's not just about women on boards, it's about leadership. But we didn't have that language in the 70s. We talked about being equal and no leaders. We talked about flat structures and hierarchies. No hierarchies. Leadership didn't come until after the feminist conversation, until after women in decision making, where 20,000 women in Beijing talked about the lack of women in decision making. So what do we want now? We want to write the legislation. So we need to be in Parliament. And we're on our way. And has nobody, has nobody on the other side noticed we have a female Prime Minister, a female Premier, a few female Governors and Governor-General? We are suddenly finding a difference. We want to be leaders in spirituality and religion. We want to create wealth and write the checks. We want to demonstrate there are better ways to run business that are more child-friendly. And we want to stop a woman dying every two minutes in childbirth and make sure that girls go to school. Feminism has been enabling for women. It's encouraged risk-taking and it's helped diminish what Simone de Beauvoir described as the concept of women as the other. What more could we ask other than it continues for all, but you have to be engaged. 
and it's a sign of success, surely. Last week I read in The Guardian that the number of obituaries for significant women is growing. Surely a sign that we're noticed in our dying. <laughs> Thank you.